We want to welcome you this morning to the house of God. We thank you for coming as we come to worship our great God. Let's enter into our hymn of praise, Be Thou My Vision, O Lord of My Heart. And if ever we needed a vision of God, surely it's today. And I trust as we meet together, we'll get a vision of who he says he is. We'll stand together after the introduction. Stand together. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart, not be all else to me, save that thou art. Thou my best Lord, by day or by night. Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. We have a few passages to read this morning as we think of the God of the impossible. And I trust that you won't just read these passages and close your Bible up and put it back in the pew, but that you'll uh, think on these words as we go through today's uh, sermon, and you'll think of what is God looking me to know this morning. And if you forget what I say, well, that's okay, but don't forget what God has to say to you through his word. Genesis chapter 12, commencing to read from verse 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee all families of the earth be blessed. So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken unto him. And Lot went with him. And Abraham was seventy and five years old. 
when he departed out of Haran. And Abraham took, his, took Sarah, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan. And into the land of Canaan they came. And then just go on to chapter 15. Chapter 15. Between these, chapter 14, we notice God renews his covenant. Lot is captured and, and rescued. Melchizedek blesses Abraham. And then chapter 15, after these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abraham in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abraham. I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abraham said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me? Seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. And Abraham said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. Behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven, and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto them, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees, to give thee this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? And he said unto him, Take me an heifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all these, and divided them in the midst, and led each one against another. But the birds divided he not. When the fowls came down upon their carcasses, Abraham drove them away. When the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abraham, and lo, and a horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abraham, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward shall they come out a great substance, and they shall go to thy fathers in peace, and thou shalt be buried in good age. And the Lord will bless the reading of this word. Let us pray. <coughs> Almighty God, we are gathered once again in your presence. And we thank you for the privilege of coming into your house among your children to read your word. And Father, we thank you that in our hand is the written word of God. That has been preserved for thousands of years. That you told us that heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. And even though kings and people have tried to burn it, have tried to ban it, have tried to bury it, yet the word of God stands sure. And we praise you that it is an incorruptible word, that it is forever settled in heaven. We thank you, Father, that it is a powerful word that it's sharper than any two-edged sword. We thank you that it can get into places in people's hearts that no human words can. We thank you that it is called the seed that can get into the tiniest cracks. It's called a sword that can divide excuses. It's called a mighty wind that can blow away any of our fears. And we pray that as we read your word that the Spirit of God might come afresh upon our minds. We thank you to have the Spirit who is our teacher, who is our guide, who has promised to be our schoolmaster and teacher, to lead and to guide us into all truth. And we ask you that as you look at our hearts this morning, there might be nothing to hinder or to stall or to prevent the workings of the Holy Spirit in our souls. We pray that you would forgive us our trespasses, forgive us of our wickedness, forgive us for how we have failed your holy goodness. We pray, Lord, you would create in us clean hands and pure hearts. We pray, Lord, that you would do this new work within our souls. We pray you would lift us up on eagles' wings. Father, we thank you that the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, still speaks, and that he that confesses his sin, that God is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, we have come to boldly declare that there is no God like our God who sits upon the circle of the earth, 
that is enthroned above, that every earthly king one day will step aside and they will bow before the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And we ask you that we would, uh, Lord, revel in your greatness, in your faithfulness, in your goodness, that in you we have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll anchored to the rock that cannot move, that in a world that is drowning in sin, that wants something real, that's looking for an answer. We thank you that Christ is still the answer to the great need of the human heart. We pray, Father, today for those who are sick. We ask that your goodness would rest upon them that they would experience the closeness of God, the one who is a refuge and strength in a time of storm. We ask you for those that are on holidays, for those that are unable to be with us, that they would not forsake the assembling of themselves together, but they will seek out like-minded people, get among the family of God, and to be able to worship you in the beauty of holiness. We thank you for bringing little Annabella successfully through our operation we praise you for your hand upon this little girl. We pray you'll continue to strengthen her and her parents as well. We praise you that you're a, not only a God-hearing, but a God-answering God, one who can do exceedingly abundantly. Above all, we're able to ask or think according to his power. We pray for little Rose Cranston, that as she goes to be, be, undergo this operation on Wednesday for her little bowel, we pray, Lord, that the hand of God would be upon her. We pray that as this little girl who's fearfully and wonderfully made, that goes under the surgeon's hand, that you'll bring peace to her little soul. And might you take, who is the great surgeon of surgeons, might you take the earthly surgeon's hand and guide him. And we're praying, Lord, and we're asking in faith that you will correct this little problem for Rose. You're a God who can do the impossible. God who has not changed. We thank the Lord for bringing Heather safely out of hospital. We ask you for con continued strength upon her body. And might she know something of the nearness of God, breathing peace to her heart. We do thank you for each one of our young people who has received the results, perhaps looking direction, looking for guidance regarding their lives. Might they look to the Lord Jesus Christ, who is their North Star the one who has promised if they trust in you with all of their heart and all their ways acknowledge God and you will direct their paths. You've never made a hash. You've never made a wrong job of someone's life when it's handed over to the great God of all creation. We pray for our driving services. We ask that your blessing might remain upon them, that, Lord, you would call out people who are unsaved and they might cling to the Lord Jesus Christ and his precious sinless blood. We've asked you for Ukraine. We pray you that you would somehow cause the gunfire to cease. You would cause the tyrants to leave. And that you would help the church to gain ground. As you have promised you'd build your church. For the persecuted church. For the lands where the Bible is banned and is buried and, buried and burned. We pray for the missionaries that are scattered there today. Seeking to cause your name to be uplifted and glorified. Bless them Lord. Add your favour for their works today. And again we look to you for the reading. And the preaching of your word. We ask you that the spirit might be pleased. To anoint me. And to help us to listen. Upon the things of God. We ask you for the children's story. In every aspect of this service. Might your favour rest upon us. In your name we pray. Amen. I know we are missing quite a few children this morning. But we're going to invite those that are here. Up to, their, up to the front pew. And Johanna is going to come. And just share with you a little Achilles talk. And I know there's sweets here for anyone who comes up. And so just come up really quickly into the front pew. And Johanna will share with us. were still sleeping thank you for those last week who colored in their sheet at the drive-in i just want to say they were so good really well done but i've got more for you this week so you can do them again tonight okay if you come tonight to the drive-in you get one of the sheets to color in so who here is looking forward to going back to school 
Louisa, what are you looking forward to going back to school for? What's good about the school? PE? Yeah, that's really good. It's good for the PE. Charlotte, what about you? You love doing work. That's a good one. It's not too many children love doing work. Isaac, what about you? Play? Yeah, and Jake? What is it? Oh, treat trolley. Oh, wow, that sounds like a good thing you have in your school. Well, who is excited to go back and see their friends? Yeah, whenever you're off over the summer, it can be a really long time before you get to see your friends again. Now, I want to tell you a story about three friends. And these three, fr three friends were called, there's a picture of them up here. They were called Charlie, Jimmy, and John. And over the summer, they were all separated because they didn't live near each other, but they all went to the same school. And coming near the end of the summer holidays, they were so excited to get to see each other again. Because they would have so much fun in school, talking to each other and having fun on the playground. And they loved to be together. And it was coming near the end of August and they were counting down the days to go back to see each other in school. And when school started back, the three boys, Jimmy, Charlie and John, went back to school and they were catching up on all that they'd done over the summer. They were telling each other about their summer holidays, where they had been, about the fun activities they had done, about all the ice cream they ate when they were off, and they were so happy to be back together again. Just like I'm sure you will be so excited to see all your friends again. But as the boys were talking to each other, they discovered that over the summer, they had got some new hobbies. Now, Charlie, he got a new hobby. Now, this picture going to come up, and I want you to tell me what do you think his new hobby was. Forget. Well, I'll get you to guess to see what. Maisie, what do you think it could have been? Um, yes! How did you know that? Well done! It was football! Over the summer, Charlie loved playing football. And he got into playing with his dad outside and he would go and he would love watching football on the TV. And then Jimmy, he, we discovered he had a new hobby. Now what do you think? What do you think just that it could have been? Rugby! It wasn't actually rugby, no. It was farming. It was farming. Who likes farming? And he's like, you like farming, don't you? Well, whenever Jimmy was at home, his dad had a farm. And he started helping his dad on the farm. And that was his hobby. And then John, he had another hobby. Now this is something you do inside. And it involves looking at a screen. What do you think his hobby was? What, just anything? It wasn't watching anything, it was... What else can you do with the screen? Uh, just that? Yeah, he got a Nintendo Switch. And he loved playing Mario Bros. And that's what he... Well... That's what John had, and he loved playing his video games. Yes, yeah, so there's the switch he loved to play. And the boys discovered in their class, there was some other, and I'll show you here. In their class, there was some other people who had the same hobby as them. So, I've got a bow here. You can see inside it, look. It's green in here, okay, and there's some past on it. So this is the wee group of boys who love playing football. And they, there were some people in the class who loved playing football. And then there was another group. See this one here, it's blue and passed in there too. And this was the wee group who loved doing farming. And then the last bowl here, you can see it's red and it's passed in there. And this group was the guys who loved playing the video games. And in this bowl here, what's in there? Yeah, just playing passes in here. And this here, We've got a plain piece of past each. One is Charlie, one's Jimmy, and one's John. Okay? And the three boys, they loved hanging out together, the three of them, because they were all Christians. They all loved God. And they all, whenever the three of them were together, they helped each other to do what was right and to live their life for God. But the boys started, remember they all different hobbies? So they started talking to these guys who also had the same hobbies as them. So Charlie, he started hanging out more with the guys who played football. And then uh, Jimmy, he started hanging out with the boys who done the farming. And John, he started hanging out more with the guys who done the, played the video games. Now there was nothing wrong with that. 
was there was a slight problem. Because the boys who loved playing football, when they were out in the football field, they would get angry and start saying bad words. And the boys who loved all the farming, they used to make fun of some of the boys and girls in their class. And the girls who loved doing video games, they used to cheat on their tests. Now, were they the right things to do? Definitely not. And as the boys, as Charlie, he started hanging out more with the football players. And as time went on, whenever he was playing football, he started to say bad words. And Jimmy, whenever he was hanging out with his friends who loved farming, he started picking on other people in his class as well. And John, whenever he was hanging out with his group of friends, he started cheating on his test. Now, do you think that was right for the boys to do that? No, it wasn't, because what were the boys? What did I tell you at the beginning, Maisie? Yeah, and they loved God. They wanted to live their lives for God. But whenever they were hanging out with these guys, they started doing these things that weren't right. Now, I want to show you here. If I take this piece of pants out, but we'll start down here, actually. Look, what's happened to Charlie? He turned green, just like out of the bowl. And then Jimmy, he was in here. He's turned blue. And then John, he was in here. He's turned red. Because whenever we put, they started off like this, started off playing. Whenever I put them into the bowl with the colours, they became just like the bowl. And they were turned green and blue and red, just like the bowls. And you know, friends are so important. And these guys' friends, they had a bad impact on them. And they started doing the things that were wrong whenever they were with them. And you know, the Bible teaches us in the book of Proverbs the importance of making good friends because bad friends can bring us away from God. And you're going to be going back to school now in a couple of weeks and your friends are so important. And if you go back to school, you might not have any good friends, but you can pray and ask the Lord Jesus to bring some friends into your life who will help you to live for God. But just go. Well, you can make some new friends. And there's a verse in the Bible I want to read you. It's in John chapter 15 and verse 13 and 14. And it says, Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. And you know, there's no greater friend you can have than Jesus. And the Lord Jesus, he laid down his life. He died on the cross and rose again so you could have your sins forgiven. And if you ask them to come into your life and forgive you for your sins, Jesus is your very best friend. So even if you have no good friends in school, you can remember that Jesus is your very best friend. So you have listened really well. Do you want to do a children's song? I don't know. I'll give you a sweetie there for listening well. Thank you very much, Johanna, uh, for sharing with the, the boys and girls. And we do welcome you this morning to the house <coughs> of God. Do you remember our announcements in this incoming week. Do you remember tonight at 6.30 p.m. is our third drive-in service as we continue the theme of Christianity Explained, Christianity Made Plain. And tonight's topic is where is the home of the Christian and the non-Christian? Where will the Christian spend eternity? And where will the non-Christian spend eternity? And I encourage you to invite someone in. Think of someone that isn't saved and invite them down to this, this very special outreach Tonight, Jenny Patterson will be sharing her testimony. As I've alluded, that Jenny lost her mother to cancer whenever she was in her, 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 her young 20s, early 20s. And uh, do remember Jenny in your prayers. Wednesday is our Bible study and prayer meeting at 8 p.m. Our Sunday morning service is 11.30 a.m. And our Sunday evening service is at 6.30 p.m. Sunday school will recommence on the 10th of September at 10.30 a.m. That is Sunday fortnight. Uh, Sunday the 10th of September. There's a selection of various items you might have noticed on our porch. Someone has said, are we planning to do a church auction? No, uh, those are all of the things that have been left, perhaps over a, the past year, and we'll put them there in the, in the little porch. Do look at them. If one of them's yours, take them. 
or else they will be donated or else they will be uh, disposed of. Reverend Henry Caskey, who has been the pastor of Limavady Independent Methodist Church, uh, will be retiring and there will be a special service to mark this, held in the, in the Limavady Church on Friday the 1st of September at 7.30pm. Let us join together for our next hymn of praise. My worth is not in what I own. And uh, let's stand together again as we worship the Lord. for someone here this morning. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you this morning and we acknowledge that we can rest in the love of God. We pray that you will help us to rejoice in the Saviour's love and find ourselves this morning thinking on things of eternal relevance. We pray that you would help us to even shut off things in our minds that have caught our attention in this past week, or that you would prevent us from thinking of things in the weeks to come, but that we might be still in your presence and know who you are and what you want to say to us this morning. Speak, Lord, in the stillness. While we wait on thee, hush our hearts to listen in expectancy 
I thank you that you have promised that if we call upon you, that you will answer and show us great and mighty things where they know us not of. And we just commend ourselves to the Spirit's leading this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. Before we continue our series on Elijah, I want us just to look at this passage in Genesis uh, chapter 18. And we'll continue to read from, from that. Genesis chapter 18. Genesis chapter 18, and the Lord appeared unto him, that is Abraham, in the plains of Mamer, as he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. And he lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will fetch a morsel of bread, and comfort ye your hearts, after that ye shall pass on. And therefore are ye come to your servant. And they said, So do as thou hast said. And Abraham hastened unto the tent, unto Sarah, and said, Make ready quickly three measures of fine meal kneaded, and make cakes upon the hearth. And Abraham ran unto the herd, and fetched a calf, tender and good, and gave it unto a young man, and he hasted to dress it. And he took butter and milk, and the calf which he had dressed, and set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree, and they did eat. And they said unto him, Where is Sarah thy wife? And he said, Behold, in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life, and lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door, which was behind him. And Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age. Abraham was 99 and Sarah was 90. And it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxed old, also I have pleasure, my Lord, being old also. And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh? Saying, Shall I of a surety bear a child which am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? Now, underline that. Is there anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Then Sarah denied, saying, I laughed not, for she was afraid. And he said, No, but thou didst laugh. And then just go to Genesis chapter 21. <coughs> Genesis chapter 21. And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said. And the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age, at the, at the set time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Sarah bare unto him, Isaac. And the Lord will bless and add his favour to the reading of his word. The Bible is a book of questions. It's a book of questions. This morning we come to the eighth question in the Word of God. It is a question found in chapter 18, verse 14. Is there anything too hard for the Lord? It is a verse that speaks loudly and a verse that speaks clearly. There is no difficulty too great for God to handle. There is no distress too big. For God to solve. There is no obstacle too wide for God to remove. For it is in God's nature to still step into the arena of our lives and do the impossible. Here the Lord asks Abraham a rhetorical question. A question that makes a point. Is there anything too hard for the Lord? In fact, there is no reply given because the answer is so obvious. The answer, of course, is no. And if not, Jeremiah, he fills in the blank space when he states in Jeremiah 32, verse 17, Our Lord God, behold, thou that meets the heavens and which made the earth, by thy great outstretched arm, there is nothing too hard for thee. Again, Job said in Job 42, verse 2, I know that God can do everything. 
Again, the angel told Mary in Luke 1, verse 37, For with God, nothing shall be impossible. And I believe there's someone here this morning, and that is exactly what you need to hear. For in our lives, we're all going through, and you may be going through, a difficult situation and season. And we need the reassurance that God cares, that God is in control of the madness and the brokenness of my life. And here we are, a promise that is, that is wrapped up and posted to you this morning. Is there anything too hard for the Lord? That means there is no request too big to ask. There is no relative too broken to be saved. There is no riddle too hard for God to solve. He is still the God of the impossible. In our passage, firstly, God makes a promise in chapter 12. In chapter 12 and in verse 2. Chapter 12, verse 2. Look at if you, if you have a copy of God's word. And I will make of thee Abraham a great nation. And I will bless thee and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing. Aside from Moses, no Old Testament character is mentioned more in the New Testament than Abraham. In fact, Abraham's life takes up a, a great and good portion of, Gen of the Genesis narrative from his first mention in Genesis 11, verse 26, the whole way to his death in Genesis 25, verse 8. But in Genesis at chapter 12, we are introduced to Abraham, a sinful heathen man living in a place called Ur of the Chaldees, which was modern-day Iraq. And one day, this man, Abraham, hears the voice of God. And his faith soars. And God enters into an agreement or a covenant with Abraham, known as the Abrahamic Covenant. And God promises Abraham that he would do three things. Three things. Firstly, give Abraham and his descendants an everlasting portion of land. Secondly, God promised Abraham that he would be the father of a great nation. And thirdly, God promised that through Abraham, all the world would be blessed. And then God sealed this unconditional promise in Genesis 15 verse 9. And God told Abraham to take five animals, a cow, a goat, a ram, a dove and a pigeon, and kill them, except for the birds, and divide their carcasses Kill all the animals, but don't divide the carcasses of the birds, but all the rest divide in two. And Abraham instantly recognized that God was setting up a blood covenant between them. A covenant that could never be broken. In fact, in, it was Jewish culture that both parties would make promises to each other and then walk between the carcasses and the agreement would be signed and sealed by blood. Yet in Genesis 15, we find something really interesting. God puts Abraham to sleep, and God alone moves between the halves of the animals, and thus the covenant was sealed by God alone. Nothing depended on Abraham. Everything depended on God, who promised to be faithful to his covenant. In fact, the writer of the Hebrews reminds us in chapter 6, verse 13, for when God made promises to Abraham because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself. Nothing of Abraham, everything of God. And surely this would be a foreshadow of Calvary, that God would, would set up alone salvation through the new covenant, through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, that man had nothing to do with it, but God had everything to do with him. And so God formed this Abrahamic covenant as this foundation. It establishes a special unconditional relationship between God and the nation of Israel that still stands today. It's a everlasting covenant. And so with all the promises of God and the age of 75, Abraham brings his wife Sarah on a journey of faith. They leave their hometown called Ur of the Chaldees, modern day Iraq, and travel a thousand miles into Canaan. And yet by the time we reach chapter 15, Abraham is still nowhere near to receiving his promised inheritance. In fact, their journey had begun with the promise of what? 
children, crowds and crowns. But now they are still childless and somewhat confused. And perhaps old Abraham, can you see him in Canaan? And he's shaking his head, left wondering, had he misunderstood God's word? Had he miscalculated God's power? And yet it was at this point in chapter 15 that God in his love came to talk with Abraham about the building of his family. And he took Abraham, the once moon worshipper who used to look up to, to, the, to the stars as a, as a means to know the future, and he says to Abraham, I'm going to share something with you. And there under the stars and silence of the dark sky, God spoke in Genesis 15, verse 5. Look at it if you will, Genesis 15, verse 5. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto them, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Do you know what the Hebrew word for believing means? It means to, that he continued on resting on what God had said. The original Hebrew word for believe is where we get our word amen, which means may it be so. And so on hearing the promise of God, Abraham looked silently to heaven and he said, amen, may it be so. May you give me an heir. Might your name be glorified among all nations? And it was counted to him as righteousness or salvation. And here Abraham was learning his first lesson that I want us to learn this morning. That there is no promise too big for God to make. There is no promise too big for God to make. In chapter 15 verse 1, And these things the word of the Lord came unto Abraham in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abraham, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Even though Sarah was 75 and Abraham was pushing 85 years of age, naturally speaking, the day of having children was gone, the flower was fading and the time was running out. And yet God's word is never dependent on our feebleness, but it's always dependent on his faithfulness. In verse 1, but the word of God came unto Abraham. And here Abraham knows that the God of the Bible is a God that speaks both a word fear not from God and a word about God, I am. Has there ever been a time in your life when the word of God and the God of the word has given you a promise? A promise for your family, a promise for your future, a promise for your failing health, a promise that in this moment it seems so absurd, it appears so impossible, it couldn't be so far from reality. But my friend, the word of God cannot fail to deliver. It is not rooted in our feebleness, but it's rooted in the faithfulness of God, one who cannot lie. Do you remember what Paul said in 1st, 2nd Corinthians 1 verse 20? For all the promises of God are yes and amen. Peter said in 2 Peter 1 verse 4, they are exceeding great and precious promises. And this was a hard promise for an elderly couple, that they would have a son and an heir. But think of me, but think with me of three hard things that God promised and that God accomplished. Firstly, God promised that the walls of Jericho would fall but that Rahab's house, which was on the wall, would be spared. And it happened. God promised Elijah that by ravens at, Sarah, at, at Cherith and by the widow of Zarephath, that he would be fed. This was a hard thing, but it happened. God promised Mary that she would have a son, though she was a virgin. This was a hard thing. But it happened. And I feel it's, it's part of our nature to focus on the problems. We magnify the giants instead of focusing on the promises of God. And, and we in our lives allow trouble and difficulty, too much airtime in our minds, instead of focusing on the God of the impossible. 
And therefore, we are like the disciples of Luke 24, verse 25, who were slow of heart to believe. When God gives you a promise for your family, for your future, for your feeling health, do you naturally magnify the difficulties? God, there's not a hope this could happen instead of magnifying the power on the faithfulness of God. And you know what I found in, in my Christian life? The, great, the, the more time you will allow your mind to be filled with the word of God and the God of the word and the greatness of God, the smaller your problems become and the more your faith it will rise up and the more you will say with God nothing shall be impossible. It's easy this morning, it takes little faith to magnify the problem and to go down the, the rabbit hole takes more faith to step out and to magnify the character of God. That he is faithful. He is forgiving. He is a force. And he is forever good. My God today, he still can make the impossible possible. I read about a little boy. And uh, one day, there, there, there was a little boy living in an estate. At the end of that estate, there was a, there was a big bully. And this big bruiser, he would often step out of his house and he would, he would point his finger at that little boy and he would laugh at him. That little boy never had the nerve to go up and stand to him. He was just too afraid and he was, hadn't enough confidence. One day his dad bought that little boy a telescope. And that little boy was in his front, <coughs> his front uh, little yard playing with it, but he was looking at it the wrong way, the wrong end. He was looking through the big side and his father came out to him and said, son, you're doing it backwards. Turn it around and everything will be bigger like it was designed to be. And he said, dad, I know that. But right now I'm looking at this bully. And when I look at him this way, it makes him so small. And that I'm not afraid of him anymore. Maybe this morning you need to turn the telescope around. You've magnified that, that giant, that problem long enough. You've talked about how impossible it is, how it's never going to work out. But maybe you need to see it from God's perspective. Is there anything too hard for the Lord? Here in this passage, do we find Abraham walking around and saying, how is this going to work out? Abraham and his faith says, God, you said you would make me a father of many nations. It looks impossible to me, but I know you can do the impossible. My friends, firstly, there is no promise too big for God to make. Secondly, there is no promise too great for God to keep. By the time we reach to chapter 16, 10 years have passed and still the cloud of childlessness and darkness hung over the tents of Abraham. And so Sarah began to, to devise a plan. She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar, of which she said to Abraham, go to her and we will have children. And we see something of the heart of Sarah. Abraham was the love of her life, but God was the love of her heart. And she was willing to sacrifice the intimacy of her husband to see the incredible promise of God fulfilled. Sarah would receive nothing out of this she would still be childish, she would still be hurting, but she was zealous for the glory of God. And Abraham listened to the voice of Sarah, and Ishmael was born. Now, according to Bible history, the, the history, the, the history of the Muslims begins with the prophet Ishmael, who was an ancestor of the prophet Muhammad. Now, why couldn't Ishmael fulfill the promise? Well, God through Noah had given the original blessing to the tribe of Shem from which Sarah and Abraham came from, yet Hagar was from the descendant of Ham. And so in an attempt to take a shortcut to get an heir through Hagar, God then reminded Abraham that he would be faithful to his promise. And that is why he reinforces his vow to Abraham in chapter 17. In chapter 17. Notice in chapter 17, and when Abraham was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, I am the Lord, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thy perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee and will, and will multiply thee exceedingly. This is a double assurance of what is earlier said. God is saying, yes, Abraham, you heard me correctly. I am a God of truth. 
I am a God of Malachi 3.16. I am the Lord, I change not. My promise will come to pass. And so by the time we reach chapter 17, Abraham is 99 years of age and Sarah 90. And so for 29 years, they've been waiting for the promise of an heir. I have to admit and be honest with you this morning that I'm not really good at waiting, especially in a day of next day deliveries and instant access. But if you ask yourself the question, why is waiting so difficult? Well, because it feels as if we're not doing anything. We like to be in control of our circumstances, and that's the point. We're not doing anything. You and I are not in control. But God wants to teach us that he is. And I believe that God often puts us in situations that are so impossible to resolve. So that whenever they are resolved, we have to step back and say, this is the Lord's doing. And marvelous it is in our eyes. We want God to do it now. For we are creatures of time, but God lives in eternity. Those seasons that you're waiting in this morning and watching is when God is doing his deepest work in your heart. He's defining us the most. When it reveals to us the depth of our loyalty and trust of God. And yet, Paul comments of Abraham's unwavering commitment in Romans 4 verse 20. It says this. Abraham staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was fully persuaded that what God had promised, he was able to perform. That there is still no promise too great for God to keep. That means this morning there's no prayer too hard for God to answer. That means there's no problem too, great, too hard for God to solve. That means that there is no person too hard for God to see. And my friends this morning, let's not tie the hands of God. Let's not limit him to our understanding. God is not limited in his answer this morning. He is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we're able to ask or think. Jesus says after the, all these things in Matthew 21 verse 22, all these things whatsoever you shall ask in prayer, believing you will receive. Why God works in a different level than we do. We have contained them to a box. But God's able to do more than that. Firstly, there's a promise. There is no promise too big for God to make. There's no promise too great for God to keep. So firstly, God makes a promise. But then God takes the initiative in chapter 18, verse 1. And the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre as he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. Abraham and his wife were living as pilgrims. They were living in tents like the Bedouin people. It was high noon. The sun was at its height, meaning it was at its warmest. And most of the eastern people were sitting under the shade of a tree or in the entrance of a tent. And here is Abraham, the father of believers, and he's sitting at the entrance of his tent and he's meditating. He's thinking on what God has said to him. The, the cogs were going around in his mind. When verse 1, the Lord appeared unto him. The Hebrew word for Lord is Jehovah, which means the self-existent one, the one who is not dependent on anything or anyone, but everyone and everything is dependent on him. Because of the heat of the day, the heat of the day, Abraham perhaps had nodded off because in verse 2, he lifted up his eyes and looked. And there was an appearing in verse 2, three men stood by. One was Jehovah, we call, it, we call this a theophany, an appearance of God in some physical form. So God was coming down to Abraham's level and God will always come down to where you're at on the journey of life so that he could communicate with him. He is sitting there in his tent and then God shows up along with two holy angels. It's God who takes the initiative to save us. To seek us. To shepherd us. Isn't that what we need to hear? That God always makes the first move. Think to your salvation. We are naturally haters of God. We didn't find God. But God found us that no man uh, can come unto the Father except the Father draw him. And naturally speaking, you wouldn't be here this morning. If God hadn't have placed it in your heart to be here. 
He has taken the lead and guided you to this church to have an encounter with him. And we ask this question, how will Abraham respond? Or put differently, how are you going to respond to what God's doing in your life? We notice the appearing, but the adoration in verse 2, and he lift up his eyes. And then he ran to the door, tent door and bowed himself toward the ground. Now remember, Abraham is 99 years of age. He's no spring chicken. He's not just a young fella who's zealous for life and a bundle of energy. But time has not withered his devotion. He could sing, he walks with me. And he talks with me along life's narrow way. For when he sees the men, he, like Peter, says, It is the Lord, and he ran. The Hebrew word is he ran swiftly. It was unheard of during Jewish culture for men to run. Never mind a 99 years, year old man. But he's like a cheetah. He's like a, an athlete. He picks up his gowns, his flowing robes. And he runs. He knows these are not normal strangers. He knows there's something extraordinary about them. And he falls to the ground like a leaf. He takes the lowest position and in a humble adoration. He says in verse 3, Lord. Which means this is a different word. It means Adonai. Sovereign one. Master, ruler. Today do we recognise whose presence we are in. For the Lord has said, for where two or three are met together in my name, there am I in the midst. The Lord has come. Do you feel that each meeting in this church is ordinary? Do you feel you just come in here in a routine way? Do you yawn this morning and you look around? Is your mind filled with everything that's going to happen next week or what's happened in this past week? But you've never come in this morning and you've sensed that God is in this place. And that God has come to meet with me. Could it be that you've developed a familiarity with the holy presence of God? That church is no different than Tesco's. No different than being in school or in work. For here's an aged man with an overwhelming sense that God is in this place. Do you see that this morning? He could say, wherever they seek you, you are found in every place as hollow ground. Could it be that you feel to sense God, not because he has moved, but because you have moved? And spiritually, you're like Jacob this morning. God was in this place and I knew it not. And over summer, you have drifted. You become casual to the things of God. But I believe that there's a true spirit and a truthful heart There'll always be an awe about meeting in the house of God. And so filled with a sense of all Abraham in verse 4 to 5 invites God to dinner. And with that he runs off again. God is too great. Time is too short. His work must be done immediately. What is God asking you to do this morning? What, is, what needs are reoccurring in your mind? Mary could say, whatsoever he doeth, saith unto you, do it. There is blessing and service to the Lord. And so Abraham, he darts off to Sarah. In verse 6, he says, run as quickly as your feet will take you. Get the ovens on. Get them fired up. Now, some ladies might say, Abraham, you do it yourself. I'm sick and tired of running after you. But Sarah is a picture of a godly woman looking to honor God through a submission to her husband's headship. And then Abraham dashes out to take his prized calf and kill it and cook it up with butter and milk. This was, of course, uh, reserved for kings and nobles and great celebrations. But the Lord deserves our very best. And therefore, Abraham and Sarah set a banquet before them. It's interesting, in verse 8, he stood by them, not with them. Abraham didn't pull a chair over to their table. But he said, I'm too unworthy to sit with the majesty of Adonai. I am too unworthy to remain in your holy presence. I am your servant. And as we begin our winter work, we must be like Abraham. God, I am your servant. I want my life to count for eternity. I'm ready. Just tell me what you want me to do. Whatever, God, I must step into this position and I must serve God with all of my glory. 
As Abraham stands, one of the men asks, Where is Sarah thy wife? Did God not know? Was he not aware of Sarah? He knew every hair on her head, every anxious thought in her mind, yet Sarah's eavesdropping. She's listening through the fabric of the tent, which was like stretched animal skins. And the Lord turns to Abraham and says, Sarah will have a son. Now remember, Abraham and Sarah are aged, they're past reproductive years. And so how would Sarah respond? In fact, how would you respond? If God gave you that promise. In verse 12, Sarah laughed. This is off the chart. It's impossible. That's exactly how Abraham responded in chapter 17. Perhaps that is why God will tell Abraham to call his son Isaac. Isaac just means laughter. That every time they would see Isaac, they would remember that they laughed at the word and promises of God. So very quickly, firstly, God made a promise. Secondly, God made, God takes the initiative Thirdly, God makes the impossible possible. Faltering faith looks inward. It cannot be done. Sarah laughed, showing her unbelief in the promise of God. I'm sure there's many times Abraham put his, his arm around Sarah and said, a son is coming. And yet she had waited 29 years, month after month, her hope and faith dashed upon the the rock of an unfulfilled dream. And through time, Sarah's heart is cautious and suspicious to believe God. And so she laughs. I know better than God. It's not going to happen. Abraham, God has broke my heart one too many times. Faltering faith looks inward and says it cannot be done. But faithful faith looks upward. And says it shall be done. It shall be done. In verse 14. Is there anything too hard for the Lord? Earlier Hagar had said thy God seest me. But now Sarah learned that only God could see inside of me. And in an instant Sarah understood that her thoughts were known unto God. That God is omniscient. He's all knowing. That an unblinking eye of God had searched her and known her. And Sarah thought, if God knows me, and he knows my thoughts, then he can do anything. And in an instant, her little soul was ploughed for the promise. Is there anything too hard for me? And within 12 months, in Genesis 21, Sarah gave birth to to Isaac. And the stage was set for the future redemptive plan. Is there anything too hard for the Lord? The answer this morning, and all of the angels of heaven, resounding no. That God opens doors that no man can no man can close, and opens doors that and closes doors that no man can open. He still makes the blind to see. He can still turn water into wine. He can still help us to walk on water. And we need to be reminded this morning in prayer. Nothing is impossible to God. We cannot downsize our prayer list. We cannot limit God. We must come boldly to the throne of grace and lift up our eyes and let our requests be made known unto God. We must hold on to that promise that he's given to you because faithful is he that is promised. We must never allow the devil to ply our hearts with doubt and discouragement and delusionment. We must never allow him to steal that promise because is there anything too hard for the Lord? I'm thankful this morning that Abraham's God is my God. That he is your God. That firstly, God has made you a promise. Secondly, God has taken the initiative to re-emphasize that promise. Thirdly, God wants you to grasp this morning That God will make the impossible possible if only you will believe and place your faith in him. Maybe there's a dark spot on your faith. May God give you a promise weeks and months and years ago and nothing's happened. The situation's the same. The person's not seen. Let me just remind you that we serve a God who always keeps his word. What he has promised you, he is faithful and he is just to do. Let us pray.
Our gracious Father, we thank you again for the life of Abraham, a man that received an unconditional promise, a man that heard the voice of God, a man that staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was completely confident that what he had promised, he was able to perform. And Father, I pray for the individual this morning who in their own quietness of heart has received a promise for their family, for their future, for their failing health. I pray against the devil who this morning has been trying to discourage, disillusion, disappoint, and to frustrate the promises of God. I ask you that you will give that individual faith. You'll give them the power to believe that with God, all things are possible. We believe in a God who has not changed, one whose promises are still yes and amen. We pray that you'll give us the eye of faith to trust you and then trust you more. We thank you, Lord, that you're a faithful God, so dependable. And so we bless you and we marvel at your goodness toward us and we bless your holy name. And this we ask, in through the name that is above every other name, the name of our Lord and Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Just take us from your house this morning. Might your favour rest upon us. In your name we ask. Amen.